Can you uh, see I'm this? I'm just wondering if it's funny. Herbivores here. Are they bovines? <laughs> it's just cows. And action. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to English 332. I am your host, Professor Matt Cohen, and this, my friends, is the birth of the American novel. Today, we're talking about George Lepard's novel, The Killers. I want to introduce a special guest first, though, my father. Professor Michael Cohen. Dad. Okay, you're you're done. Thanks, Dad. I love my father and my mother. Dad, you read The Killers. What did you think of it? Wonderful. Really? What did you like about it? This is what I always do to them in discussion. I'm like, oh, you liked it. What did you like about it? I liked the part where they're leaping from roof to roof and being burned up. There's nothing quite like incinerated <laughs> corpses. Isn't it great when your dad tells you stuff like that? Don't I look smart with all these books around me? Yeah, they're not mine. They're his. Thanks for letting us use your office. You're welcome. Appreciate it. That's my brother Dan behind the camera, by the way. Figured we'll that out. We'll show you a picture later. Yeah, I'll bet we will. In fact, I look I like saw this. <laughs> Handsome. Here we go. The Killers. If you look on the first slide, you will see my office hours. I look forward to seeing you. That's it. There we go. Our theme today is The Killers, Race, Industrialization, and Publishing in Philadelphia, 1849 to 51. Um, I, well, you can go ahead and go to the first slide. This week, we take on the sensationalist genre with a short, chaotic novel by George Lepard called The Killers. Published, you have to say it that way. The Killers. Published in 1849 and based on a massive race riot that happened in Philadelphia on election day of that year. Remember our four categories for how to understand literature, form, content, style, and context. The form and style of this novel are unmistakably sensationalist. They draw from the hottest headlines of the day and they spin a thrilling, lurid, sometimes sexy and violent tale with them. Now, while the content of Hobomok was set in the distant past, here it's set in the present. Actually, uh, part of it is set on the day that its first readers were reading the end of the novel. This means that the content of the novel and its historical context are very closely related. It's, it's hard to separate the two out from each other, which is kind of cool. So I've asked you to read this book both to familiarize yourself with the style and form of the early sensational novel, but also so that we can look at how a novelist used the hot button issues of his time, not just to weave a story, but to try to change history, in effect, to change his context, to intervene. The sentimental mode and the didactic style that we saw in Charlotte Temple will also appear in this novel. But there's a crucial difference between this text and the previous two. Charlotte Temple was concerned with the heart, with people's feelings, interpersonal relationships. Hobomock was concerned with building an epic past for a new nation. Lepard's The Killers works kind of in the middle territory. It focuses on one city and the tensions over wealth and ethnicity that were tearing it apart. By Lepard's time, now 20 years after Hobomock was published, America's cities were growing at an unprecedented rate. Massive waves of immigration were happening, and steam-powered industrial technologies were transforming both the economy and how people related to their work. Small artisans began to dwindle, mass production factory work began to be more common. Lepard writes a novel in which hard-working everyday people despite being preyed on by the court system and the banking system, went out in the end by blackmailing the bad guys and ending an illegal slave importation conspiracy. Industrialization is really in certain ways the theme of this week, a major transformation in the United States history that changed the course of literary expression as well. This is part of our ongoing attempt to figure out not just what literature teaches us about the past, but about why literature mattered. On your slide, you will see a definition of industrialization, the large-scale introduction of manufacturing, advanced technical enterprises, and other mass production-oriented economic activity into a country or a region. This also refers to the way in which an economy comes to be thought 
by politicians and citizens and investors to be dependent upon industrialization for its survival. So industrialization, when we use that word, we're referring both to a set of like real world transformations in how work is done, but we're also referring to ideas about it and expectations about it. And as a result of that belief, industry takes on its own kind of agency or power, becoming simply the way things are, irrespective of the costs to individuals' quality of life, and in many cases to their survival itself. Industrialization in the United States accelerated urbanization by drawing populations out of the countryside to factories in and around cities, and drove massive immigrant populations out of the unstable economies of Europe and into the United States. The conflicts this caused, racial, ethnic, class, regional, religious, gender-based conflicts, all of those had effects on how people wrote and on what literature could be imagined to do. But industrialization at the same time made it possible to print literature cheaply and to distribute it over land, not just by water. In The Killers, we have the powerful collision of both of these trends and their effects, a text whose fascinating history and ability to contribute to a climate of labor unrest and class dissatisfaction was dependent in part on the very technologies that were causing new forms of social unrest. If you look at the next slide, you have a picture of the handsome George Lepard. He was born on a farm outside Philadelphia in 1822. He had a hard childhood. His parents were ill, they were unable to work, and he and his siblings were largely raised by relatives in Philadelphia. So you start to see in Lepard himself actually this relationship between the country and the city that begins to change under the conditions of the rise of the city and urbanization. As a teenager, Lepard was intended for training in the ministry, but he dropped out of a Methodist seminary at age 15. It's, it's kind of easy to imagine how somebody who would write a book like The Killers, you know, maybe might not have like had a great time in seminary. His father died almost immediately after this happened. Unfortunate coincidence, Lepard found himself homeless in the middle of one of the worst economic collapses in the United States' history, uh, the Panic of 1837. Lepard was employed as an assistant in law offices, but didn't pay very much, so he was functionally homeless for a while. The fierce advocacy of justice for working people that shapes the killers was rooted in Lepard's early experiences like this, and it was the driving force behind his extraordinary, if as you can see from the slide, very brief literary career. He got a start in the literary marketplace with a penny newspaper in Philadelphia called The Spirit of the Times, where he worked as a copy editor and as a reporter. So a penny paper is one of the many mass-produced, often controversial and combative newspapers that had been made possible by industrial printing technologies. If you look at the next slide, you'll see an example of a penny paper or, or what's known as a story paper that uh, Lepard himself eventually came to be an editor of. If you look in the top, right of that image. And you can see there's a ruler on there. You can see how giant these things are, right? You see it says $2 a year, right? So you're getting a weekly paper for pennies, basically. Lepard began to make a name for himself with satirical columns, writing later for a paper called The Citizen Soldier. He wrote a literary column called The Spermaceti Papers that made fun of other writers. This, what? Gross. Do you have to bleep that out? Man! Wait, that was you though, dude. That was me, but... I'll replace it with mom. <laughs> His novels were fast moving, as you may have noticed, often lurid tales designed to raise the emotions and transform political beliefs of their readers. They were sold cheaply, wrapped in they were wrapped in the distinctive yellow paper covers that at this time indicated to potential buyers that a book was fast and cheap and an exciting read. You can see one of those in the next slide. This is a copy of his book, The Nazarene. It's estimated that between, and this is kind of nauseating to me, honestly, as someone who has to write for a living, it's estimated that between 1842 and 1852, Lepard produced an average of a million words annually in novels, in essays, in lectures. At a time when Thoreau, his social criticism that we know so well today, Walden, right, went virtually unnoticed, Lepard's work took the nation by storm. It provoked constant controversy. It caused unprecedented sales of his fiction. You take a look at the next slide, you'll see his best-selling novel, The Quaker City, or Monks of Monk Hall. This was a bestseller. It was published in 1844, and it drew on European Gothic conventions, a new genre of urban horror and scandal, most influentially formulated by the French writer Eugène Sue, 
in his book Le Mystère de Paris, or The Mysteries of Paris, you see an excerpt from one of its serialized sections there on the left. The impacts of industrialization and the fluctuations of largely unregulated economic markets were felt by city residents in the ways uh, that I think you know a lot of people experience in them today as well. Overcrowding, long working hours, corruption, seemingly random violence, gang warfare, racism and xenophobia, and occasional deadly epidemics. There was a pervasive unpredictability to the economy, even to social stability, that seemed to undermine both morals and the rhetoric of American progress. It was supposed to be a better place than the old world, and yet it seemed to be just as bad. In novels like The Quaker City and The Killers, Lepard offered social criticism through a sensational depiction of life in the city. Now, while these books do draw on Gothic elements, ultimately, the formal or the stylistic effects are secondary to Lepard's arguments on behalf of his fellow working class residents of the city. The story of the making of the killers, as much as we know about it anyway, is a good example of how Lepard approached the literary marketplace and it's a window onto the troubled landscape of race, ethnicity, class, and labor in American cities of the early 19th century. The Killers is a classic tale of antebellum Philadelphia, antebellum meaning before the Civil War. The story begins in the hallowed halls of academic learning at Yale University, but it quickly recenters its plot into the landmarks of antebellum Philadelphia, taking the reader through the solitary cells of Philadelphia's modern marvel Eastern State Penitentiary, to the print shops that were made famous by Benjamin Franklin, and the historic free black neighborhood of Southwest Philadelphia. You can take a look at your next slide. Lepard takes what is known as the California House Riot as the violent setting for the sensational climax of this novel. At 9 o'clock on Tuesday evening in 1849, after the fall elections, a violent riot broke out at the corner of 6th and St. Mary Streets, setting off a three-day race riot. There was a long-standing free black population in Philadelphia. This area was one of the centers of its life. F uh, slavery had been outlawed in Philadelphia for a long time. So there were increasing tensions between the older residents and the new immigrant populations over culture, over religions, jobs, and resources. In this case, an Irish Catholic gang known as the Moyamensing Killers launched an attack on a tavern that was called the California House. It was kept by an African-American man who was known as Hercules and a white woman who was rumored to be his wife. At the direction of William McMullen, who was the gang leader of the killers, the Moyamensing Hose Company, so this is the, the firemen that came to try to put out the fires, they rammed the four-story California house with a wagon full of blazing tar. A desperate fight broke out between the gang and the African Americans who resided in that area. It was a vital epicenter of African American life in Philadelphia, threatened by this riot. Two days of fighting, two men were shot dead the first night, a third died the following day. 25 more people were severely wounded with little chance of survival. We tend to think of Philadelphia as a friendly place, a peaceful place, the cradle of democracy, the self-styled styled city of brotherly love. But these kinds of riots, as you can see from the poster on the left, happened almost every year there during this time. There is not a city in the Union, wrote the newspaper The National Era, more shamefully mob-ridden than Philadelphia. I guess they never went to D.C. <clears throat> anyway, in the 1840s, in part because he was so good at turning current events into gripping novels, Lepard was more widely read than Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and lots of other people who are super famous writers today. You must be kidding me. Don't these people know that I am performing? It's fine. Everything's fine. Sheep. Action! Whatever makes you country, dude. In the 1840s, in part because he was good at turning current events into gripping novels, Lepard was more widely read than many people you have heard of. Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Herman Melville, you name it. Immediately after the riots, Lepard penned a short 36-page novella called Life and Adventures of Charles Anderson Chester, the notorious leader of the Philadelphia Killers. It's listed as published by the House of Yates and Smith in Philadelphia, but no such house existed. Never trust a title page. Lepard and or his partner, Joseph Severn, probably had it printed independently. 
Charles Anderson Chester follows the story of Chester as he develops into the leader of the notorious Irish Catholic gang, the Moya Mensing Street Killers. Chester is not Irish, uh, the killers predominantly were, but he is described as the wayward son of a Philadelphia banker who's wealthy, who escapes to Cuba with over $5,000 of his father's fund after his disinheritance as an illegitimate son. The number of important contexts for this novel. The revolutions of 1848 are one of them, um, so I'll talk about that for just a second. It's an American novel in many ways, but America is understood in the killers only as part of a much larger system of global conflict and competition, right? Because you've got the international slave trade happening, you've got this kind of manipulation by a Cuban character of an American character in order to get revenge on him. They're going to get the street gang together, have them do this riot to steal the money of Jacob Hicks, and then they're going to take all of them to Cuba to do a filibuster, right, to take over the Cuban government for the United States. Throughout Europe and in parts of South America in 1848, there were a series of largely failed revolutions, about which Lepard, who was somebody who was interested in revolution and the people taking control, was very excited. He was a visionary for a better future for the working class, and so like many observers, he was very disappointed when these revolutions fell apart and failed to succeed in their goals. And what happened? Of course, in the end, was that the monarchs came back and took over again. And especially in France, this was disappointing. France had had a revolution before, should have worked out. So the themes of labor unrest, organization, international conspiracy that this novel engages are in part a result of his, in, his engagement with global politics and the international exchange of ideas about reforming society that were current in his time. Now, the exact composition history of the book that you read is not known, but it seems likely that both the long version and the short version of it, and you've got the short version if you want to read it in the back of your text, um, but it seems like they were both being published at the same time. He must have written the short version first, and then he kind of expanded it as he was publishing it week by week in the story paper. Uh, it appeared as a serial uh, over five weeks, starting in the beginning of December 1849. Now, his name wasn't on it. As again, like Hobomach, it was published without his name on it. It was just a uh, note that said it was written for the paper, the Quaker City, of which Lepard was the editor, so you might guess that perhaps he had a hand in it. Very soon after that, um, the pamphlet version appeared. It was also anonymous. And in fact, it wasn't until 1851 when the book was republished as The Bank Director's Son, maybe not as good a title as The Killers, let's face it, that it actually had his name on it and people found out who it was. Now, it wasn't uncommon at the time for a, a slightly scandalous novel that was uh, supposedly revealing all of the dark side of um, the economy of uh, Philadelphia. Well, it wasn't surprising for somebody not to put their name on it. Um, but uh, we're not entirely sure why he left his name off this um, edition. Uh, if you look at the next slide, the uh, slide number eight in your presentation, you can see uh, a copy of the title page there of the bank director's son from 1851. Um, and you will see, well, you know, it's true. It's a bad title, but then it does say at the bottom, the beautiful Kate Watson, right? So he's still trying to keep up the interest in it, keep it a little sensational. Shortly after the publication of the second version of The Killers under the new title The Bank Director's Son, Lepard actually turned much of his attention away from writing fiction to focus on a project that he had been recently involved in founding known as The Brotherhood of the Union. This was a secret society, something like a labor union, but it united all the trades rather than being specialized, right? Like usually unions are based around one or another kind of trade, the Teamsters, like truck drivers, and so on. And that's been expanded in the modern age. But in the early days, it really was organized around specific industries. And in this case, there were two innovations. Lepard made this a secret society in part so that it could be interstate. So it could actually be not just one region or locality, but many, many states and to bring in lots of different trades. He called the Brotherhood a practical everyday worker in the cause of labor. So he personified the labor union as a single kind of, it's kind of an early idea of corporation, right? Fighting back against the corporation by creating a corporation made of workers themselves. So 
One way to look at this is that toward the end of what was admittedly a short career, Lepard began to turn away from fiction writing as a site of effective political engagement. It wasn't fulfilling his goals, and his labor story paper and his work with the Brotherhood of the Union were trying to create working class identifications among his readers that were antagonistic to the goals of free enterprise in ways that he thought might be more effective than fiction. Lepard promoted the Brotherhood in his labor story paper with the hope that it would bring workers into an organized body, as he said, because this combined and associated strength will provide a fair antagonist for all the overgrown capitalists and monopolists in the world. In short, this is kind of an early 99 percenter movement. Lepard's class on labor politics meant that he rewrote the 1849 Philadelphia race riot as having been started not because of racial tensions at the root, but by the avarice and greed of the son of a moneyed capitalist turned Cuban slave trader. The real historic conditions of the race riots, which pitted Irish labor immigrants against black labor migrants, deeply disturbed Lepard's sense of class solidarity. Lepard wrote in an Irish valet at the beginning, right? This is a dude who speaks in a rich Hibernian. Um, but then the Irish presence kind of evaporates from the rest of the killers. He revises the life and adventures of Charles Anderson Chester, the short version, into a slave trade allegory, and the killers add to this whole thing about Cuba and the slave trade and so, and so on. And this is kind of an effort to resolve the contradictions of free labor in the historic conditions of the race riots. So the novel ends with a curious little footnote protesting the ills of the foreign slave trade, which Congress had deemed an act of piracy after 1808. The address by President Zachary Taylor that is quoted here in the end in that footnote is real. And so that means, since that address was given during the month in which The Killers was being published, it had already started being published, that the novel was actually altered while it was in the course of being published. That's weird. The international slave trade was still going on in the form of smuggling, even though bringing slaves into the United States had been prohibited in 1808, so Lepard is tapping into that controversy as well. The chapters dealing with Jacob D.Z. Hicks's estranged biological son Elijah Watson chart his experiences at Philadelphia's famous Eastern State Penitentiary, imprisoned in solitary for the crime of attempting to pass counterfeit bills at one of Hicks's banks. Lepard drew that character of Elijah from the genre of sensational crime literature that was extremely popular at the time and which dangerously encouraged readers to align themselves with the criminal and against the justice system that punished them. An honest man pushed by criminal activities to survive, Elijah's sentence in Eastern State and the events that follow his release criticized the justice system and state authority couched in the melodramatic plot of family estrangement and resistance against fatherly authority. Think about the families in this novel. Is there a model happy family to be found? It's only when the half-siblings Kate and Elijah get away at the end, they run off together to California, that we get something like a healthy family. Even then it's kind of a little weird. Because he's like, she's my sister, but she's not my sister, and then they're sort of happily ever after in California. Anyway, I don't know what's going on there. So there, I've given you a lot of context and a lot of content. So I want to turn back for a second to the form and style of this novel, and then zoom in on a few important moments in it. So take a look at your next slide. This novel is a sensational novel. Sensationalism is a mode of writing that involves using outrageous, exciting, or shocking stories or language in order to provoke public interest or excitement. And it's very often associated with journalism, um, the National Enquirer, Infowars, um, but you can find it in lots of other formats as well. And The Killer shows that that line between fiction and fact can be very thin. Lepard was a journalist. After all, the story is based in real events, with a set of fictional storylines that are woven through it, and the narrator often mentions real places, people, and controversies as he tells a tale that is set in a very real place and time. This means that, for all the sensationalism is a form of exaggeration, it is often a powerful literary tool for addressing real problems in society. Take a look at the next slide. We'll start to kind of look at a few spots in this novel that I think are particularly memorable from this standpoint. 
In this first one, this is the moment when DZ Hicks is reading a letter from his wife that tells him that uh, she's leaving him uh, and informs him that he has a son who's uh, his biological son that he doesn't know about. And he's reading this letter and he's uh, projecting what it's going to say. Sentiment, I suppose, he says. Chock full of sentiment, he muttered as he opened the letter and held it toward the window. Romantic talk about the bruised heart, the disparity of age and whatnot. It's full of such stuff, I suppose. So he's, he's like, oh, this is a Charlotte Temple-like letter, right? This is sentimentalism. And he's expecting that, of course, since it's a woman, that she's going to be issuing these empty uh, romantic um, statements. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. Uh, and just a little bit later, she says, Now I have a sort, of, a sort of confession to make you, which I don't make from any sentimental idea of repentance and all that sort of thing, but because I really do wish you a service, I wish to do you a service. That second child did not die. He is now living. So she anticipates that he, being a bad guy, right, is going to project onto her the sentimental mode, and she bounces back and she says, No, no, buddy, here's some realism right in your face. But a month after this incident, the three banks failed, insurance companies and copper mines went by the board, and the hat of Mr. Hicks, with an affecting letter in the lining, was found on the wharf. So Hicks decides to leave after his son takes the money and bankrupts him. He cashes in on the banks, ruins a whole bunch of people's lives, and then he writes an affecting letter. He takes the sentimental mode, right? He wants to make people cry about his misfortunes. So here, one of the things that's happening, as you can see, the, these different genres are being attached to different uh, bodies. They're being attached to different gendered figures. Uh, women are supposedly supposed to write in the sentimental mode. Men are supposed to be realistic and dismissive about the sentimental mode. But in fact, all that is overturned here. All that is shown here just to be a kind of performance, right? That people use in order to manipulate other people. An important moment. Um, I just want to take a look at the next slide, uh, at this one scene in which the narrator speaks to us directly. Um, it, in, a, in a way, sets aside both of those modes and says, you know what, I'm going straight back to the didacticism of Charlotte Temple and I'm going to tell you what I think about solitary confinement. This is part of a broader culture of reform that included women's suffrage, temperance, that is anti-alcohol activism, and anti-slavery. This was an age in which people thought the positive transformation of the world, the fulfillment of the American Revolution's promise, could be brought into being. Lepard's damnation of the respectable killers in the introduction to the story paper version of the killers reveals to us for the first time a systematic analysis of political economy, one that claims poverty is systematically produced in order to benefit the wealthy by means of the laws, the courts, the police, the banking system, and industrialization. So here in this quotation about solitary confinement and capital punishment, we actually get a systematic critique by preventing instead of punishing crime, he says, things will become better. Spend the money which you now lavish upon gibbets, almshouses, and jails, upon a broad system of education which shall embrace all classes of society. And then he says specifically, destroy the unjust laws, which by enriching one class continually tempt a portion of the other to commit crime. Let's take a look at your next slide. The question of education right, where people learn what they learn, is interesting in this novel. And it comes up a number of times, and one of my favorite spots is when they're in the den of the killers, and the killers are partying, they're drinking and smoking cigars and gambling, and uh, the there's a description of the walls of the den of the killers. The walls were quite pictorial, Lepard writes, being plastered over with theater bills on which the names of Jakey, Mose, and Lies appeared in conspicuous letters. Now, those are the kind of stock characters of the melodramatic uh, fiction of the theater and uh, in working class neighborhoods. Thus hinting at the fact in city life that the pit of the theater sometimes educates killers, even as the box of the theater, that is to say, the pit of the theater is where the cheap seats are, the box is the expensive seats, very often produces full-fledged puppies who carry hair on their upper lips and opera glasses in their hands. Now here you have the explosion of popular entertainment in urban areas being summoned as a space in which people are actually learning something. This kind of literature is training people, and it's training people not necessarily to be good. Uh, look at your next slide. This is a scene in which we get a description of the daily life of the people in one of the hardest hit areas in terms of poverty. 
This district, Lepard says, has been for two years the scene of perpetual outrage. Here, huddled in rooms thick with foul air and drunk on poison that can be purchased for a penny a glass, you may see white and black, young and old, man and woman, cramped together in crowds that fester with wretchedness, disease, and crime. This mass of misery and starvation affords a profitable harvest to a certain class of hangers-on of the law. And on the one hand, you see here that critique again of the rich who are taking advantage of the poor. But at the same time, this is a dark picture of a dystopian democracy. Look, here are all the races and ethnicities and genders mixed together, except that unlike it being a happy picture of um, a democ democratic um, uh, collaboration, it's a hideous scene of decay. Uh, this isn't a Statue of Liberty moment, this isn't a Coke commercial. This is Lepard saying the dreams that you have of America being an example of all kinds of people being able to live together may in fact be turning out to be a nightmare. And then that last um, slide, there's a way in which there are moments in this novel, for all that I'm suggesting, that it is being drawn from the lurid headlines of the day, that it's being designed to attract your attention to certain kinds of political issues, there are ways in which there are moments of poetry in here. There are moments of symbolic, um, symbolic emblems kind of being created of uh, the conditions in which Lepard felt that he and his fellow Philadelphians were living. And this one I think is one of them. This is from the scene in which um, Elijah returns to his father's house and finds Don Jorge uh, has been assassinated while in the attempt to steal the money from Hicks's um, safe. Mr. Hicks, for reasons of his own, had concealed a loaded pistol in the poplar box, which was connected with a sliding lid by a complication of clockwork machinery. The pistol was so arranged that the drawing of the lid pulled the trigger, and the lid could not be drawn unless the box was placed against the breast in such a manner that the muzzle of the concealed pistol would rest within ten inches of the heart of the man who might attempt to open it. Don Jorge had drawn the sliding lid and paid for that trifling deed with his life. <clears throat> Remember. Uh, what's in this box? In this box are all the records of the slave trade that, that has been going on with Don Jorge's father and Jacob Hicks. So in a way, trying to access that history, access that past, that archive of slavery and the continued uh, misuse of American freedom, that's what kills Don Jorge. So there's kind of a, a message from Lepard. He's going to uncover the truth no matter how dangerous that act of uncovery might be. Literature is the avenger here, the defender of the innocent, the defender of the silenced. Now, our next novel that we will be reading offers a very different take on the question of social criticism and trying to achieve that utopian vision of America. It's Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Blythedale Romance. Your copy does not look like this, and that's good even smells old. As you read it, note how different its style is from Lepard's, or from that of Charlotte Temple, let's say, even though it also is responding to current events. And note one other very important difference from all three of the novels we've read before, a difference that fundamentally changes what it's like to read the Blythedale romance. It's told all from the standpoint of one character. The narrators of the other novels have been able to get inside the heads of each of the characters. They, they tell us what they're thinking, they explain their motives. Not so in the Blythedale romance. A bit more realistic, you might say, since that's how all of us have to live in this world. Maybe. I look forward to seeing what you think of it. Thank you, people. I'll see you next time. This job is so hard. Should we sing some songs? You were the first thing that I thought of when I thought I'd drink you off my mind. I get lost in the liquor. You're the only one I find. All right, here we go. If I did the things I ought to, it still would not be mine. So I keep a tight grip on the bottle. Getting loose and killing time. Okay, well.